In recent decades, we have seen greenhouse gas emissions rise rapidly. This has been largely driven by our reliance on fossil fuels in pursuing economic development and industrialization. Asia and the Pacific has seen deepening climate change impacts. Disasters and extreme weather are increasing in a region that has limited resources for mitigation and adaptation. A sprawling global production network and deepening global value chains are among the major causes of higher emissions. In fact, production-based carbon dioxide emissions from global value chains grew significantly faster than emissions from other sources. This is of particular concern for developing Asian economies, as they have become critical players within global value chains. To help reduce the carbon footprint of global value chains, there are policy options available. Carbon pricing can be the most efficient mechanism in internalizing the environmental costs of production. Trade agreements can help decarbonize value chains by including environmental provisions. Accurately measuring emissions from and within global value chains can underpin appropriate monitoring and regulation measures. Many economies have launched carbon pricing mechanisms. But the fragmented nature of carbon pricing creates the risk of carbon leakage, as emissions could rise when production is moved from an economy with more stringent environmental policies to one that is more lenient. This, in turn, motivates the introduction of carbon border adjustment mechanisms. The European Union's carbon border adjustment mechanism is expected to cut carbon leakage from the EU's emission trading scheme by around a half. However, it will have a limited effect on global carbon dioxide emissions, and it is likely to reduce both global trade and Asia's exports, while production in some downstream sectors within the EU will also decline. That said, extending carbon pricing and carbon border adjustment mechanisms to other regions may reduce global emissions significantly, although the carbon leakage problem may persist without a global solution. Different distributional impacts across economies will require careful consideration and discussions of the economic incentives for joining in these initiatives. A holistic approach is crucial in decarbonizing global value chains. This can be done by increasing investments in green infrastructure, promoting technological advancement, and prioritizing sustainable investment across value chain segments. Please read our latest Asian Economic Integration Report to learn more. So good morning, everyone. So welcome to Asian Impact uh, webinar uh, by the Asian Development Bank, uh, which will be on the decarbonizing global value chains. I believe uh, almost all of us will agree that the global value chain has been the integral uh, part of the Asia's development economic growth story. But at the same time, uh, it has had some kind of unintended uh, uh, outcomes on the environment. Um, so some may say that it has been the outcome of the competitive advantage between the advanced and the de developing countries. Um, they, in the case of Asian countries, we have been using the competitive advantage uh, benefits in terms of utilizing the low production cost, cheap labor cost, and the resource endowments. But uh, still, the, the region may not be fully exonerated from the, some uh, degree of the responsibility to the environmental footprints of global value chain. So our annual flex report, uh, 2024, Asian e Economic Integrity Report delves uh, deep down into this uh, crucial issue. And then the today's seminar will be uh, built on the analysis and discussions made in our flex report. So today we'll be discussing how we can address these environmental challenges uh, from the global value chain expansion while maximizing uh, still the economic benefits of globalization and the expansion of the global value chain. So with that, I'd like to um, ask my colleague, uh, Neil uh, Foster McGregor, uh, McGregor, the Senior Economist of the uh, Economic um, Cooperation uh, Integration uh, Division of the Economic Research and Development Pact Department ADB to make the 15 minutes presentation, which will be followed by panel discussion with esteemed panelists, along with the uh, uh, q uh, with the floor. So uh, let me hand it over to you, uh, Neil. Thank you, Jungwoo. 
So yes, so as, as John Guru has indicated, the theme chapter of the AIR24 is on decarbonizing global value chains. And that really builds upon the AIR 2023, which was talking about trade, investment, and climate change. And so maybe a, a useful place to start then would be to think a little bit about why that explicit focus on global value chains and the decarbonization of global value chains in this year's report. And fundamentally, the starting point for that is this sort of idea that global value chains have been considered to be perhaps the main development paradigm over the last three decades or so. So by splitting up the production process into smaller activities, global value chains have allowed developing countries to more rapidly industrialize, to more rapidly integrate into the global production system. And through that have created um, employment, have created growth, have created productivity, and have allowed for knowledge and technology to diffuse across borders. So fundamentally, therefore, we believe that global value chains have been a, a positive force for development over the last, the last few decades. At the same time, I think it's increasingly the case that there, there are concerns around global value chains, as, as John Wu has already indicated, and, and they relate to many aspects, but particularly to the role of global value chains in rising CO2 emissions and greenhouse gas emissions more generally. And one aspect or one reason for that is because the sexual structure of global value chains tends to be quite specific when compared with other types of production, such as production that pure, surely, sur purely serves domestic demand or traditional trade. So global value chains tend to be concentrated in manufacturing and extractive sectors that tend to be the relatively dirty sectors in the economy. Moreover, there have been concerns about the idea of this pollution haven hypothesis, the idea that firms in the developed world are likely to offshore some of their dirty activities to other countries that maybe have more lax regulations and maybe are less emissions efficient and that's pushing up global, global emissions. And through that effect, uh, there've been sort of increasing concerns around the, the issue of carbon leakage, the idea that national governments no longer have control over regulating the, the emissions that their firms take place, because again, firms can offshore some of that. And, and I think that essentially is one of the major motivations for, for the EU CBAM, the carbon border adjustment mechanism that sort of came into force in October last year in a, in a transition phase, as a way of sort of dealing with that carbon leakage. And so that raises the question, does climate change and do the, the, the various climate change policies that are being implemented present a risk to the global value chain development model? And if so, what are the kind of policy options that can help us decarbonize global value chains to avoid to avoid those risks? Before we get to the, the, the sort of policy aspects, I think it's relevant and useful to talk a little bit about um, global emissions in a general sense and, 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 what, and what global value chains contribute to those global emissions. And what we have in this slide then are, are a couple of figures. On the left-hand side, we report an index of global emissions. That's the that's the blue the blue lines. These are total CO2 emissions. And what we've seen is that since 1995 up to 2018, which is the, the, the data span that we have, global emissions of CO2 have risen quite rapidly. So they've risen by about 57%. But if we construct the, an indicator of emissions related to global value chains, emissions due to global value chains have increased even more, so about 84%. So what this means, of course, is that global value chains are accounting for a higher share of, of CO2 emissions um, globally. The right-hand figure then shows the, the contribution of Asia split between developing and developed Asia to, the, to these emissions, to these GVC-related emissions. And we also see that there's been a rapid rise in the share of GVC related emissions due to developing Asia. So Asia as a whole increased its share from 23 to 42% between 1995 and 2018. But the majority of that increase was due to developing Asia. And that particularly started around the sort of GVC era, era um, with the sort of um, accession of, of China to the, to the WTO and so on. So there was a big sort of increase around the early 2000s when the, the GVC era really, really took off. Focusing on, on global emissions, so global CO2 emissions, what this figure shows is the growth rate of CO2 emissions by region. And obviously, we, we see that there are, there are large differences in the growth rate of emissions by region. And emissions are much higher, or the growth rate of emissions are much higher in developing Asia, where they increased by 114% between 1995 and 2018. Conversely, in some of the developed regions, North America, developed Asia, and the EU especially, emissions growth was much lower or even negative. In thinking about those, those aggregate emissions growth, we can also split that into a so-called scale effect and an efficiency effect. So the scale effect is the idea that as production increases, 
then the amount of emissions released will also increase. And we can split that into, into two terms, one due to population growth and one due to the production per person, essentially. So how much the gross output is being produced by per person. And then a second effect would be a sort of emissions efficiency effect, whereby through technological change and so on, emissions um, may, may, may fall in, in response to increased efficiency uh, for a given level of output. And we can split that, uh, that overall growth rate into those two terms. And what we see unsurprisingly is that it's, it's the scale effect, the sort of increase in gross output per, per person that's driving the growth in global emissions. Conversely, we see a negative effect of this emissions, emissions efficiency effect. So technological change has worked to reduce global emissions, but the, the rate of technological progress has been not enough essentially to, to overcome the increase in emissions due to the rising scale of production. And I think that leads to an initial conclusion, which is that to a large extent, many of many of the emissions that or the emissions growth that we see is actually due to a lifestyle choice. It's due to rising consumption per person, essentially, in different parts of the world. So that may lead to this initial conclusion that in order to decarbonize global value chains, but also to decarbonize more generally, there may need to be some lifestyle changes um, in terms of reducing consumption per person as a, as a way of decarbonizing production. Turning specifically to, to global value chains, again, we were just to report a, a couple of the, the main results um, from, the, from the theme chapter. And the, the, the figure on the left there shows a scatter plot of the GVC share in value added. So what is the contribution of global value chain production to value added against the global value share in CO2 emissions production? So what is the global value share in, in global uh, and total emissions production? And what we see is that there's a nice positive correlation between those two, but we also see that most points lie above the 45 degree line. So what this indicates, of course, is that the GVC share in emissions is higher than the GVC, GVC share in value added, sort of confirming this idea that the global value chains tend to be tend to be relatively dirty. And I think it's important to again mention here that this doesn't necessarily mean that, that the technologies and so on within global value chains result in dirty, dirty um, production. It's maybe more about the sectoral structure of global value chains that they do tend to be concentrated in those manufacturing sectors rather than in, in services and so on. And it's also maybe relevant to, to mention this idea that just because we observe this effect, it doesn't necessarily mean that global value chains are causing high emissions because ultimately the consumption that's being served by global value chains would need to be served by some kind of production. And it's unclear whether that, whether that other form of production would be more or less emissions intensive. The second figure, the figure on the right-hand side, shows the association between the level of GVC production and the level of um, GVC-related emissions. And what we observe when we split between developed and developing economies, again, is nice positive correlation. So a higher level of GVC production is associated with a higher level of, of emissions, as you'd expect. But the interesting thing about this figure is that while in the case of developed economies, a 1% increase in GVC production is associated with a 1% increase in emissions, so they scale linearly. For developing economies, however, that that's, that 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 um, relationship is no longer proportional. A one percent increase in GVC production is associated with a more than one percent increase in emissions from that from that production. What that indicates is is this idea that as as the scale of GVC production inc increases in in the developing economies, the the sort of average emissions emissions per unit of output rise. So the sort of diseconomies of scale, which again, raises challenges about how to decarbonize production in the context of global value chains, especially in, in the, developing, the developing world. So what we've tried to do then in those first couple of slides is to talk a little bit about some of the challenges uh, regarding global value chains and, and, and CO2 emissions. And what we've shown is that GVC related emissions are rising relatively rapidly and, and therefore contributing a greater share of emissions in, in the economy, in the global economy. We've also sort of touched upon the idea that GVC production tends to be relatively dirty because it tends to be concentrated in those sectors that have high emissions intensities. And we've also tried to highlight this idea that emissions associated with GVCs are often difficult to regulate by national bodies. So because of the footloose nature of global value chains, it can be the case that firms simply offshore their dirty production to other, other countries to avoid national climate policies and national regulations. And in response to that, of course, efforts like the EU CBAM have been um, adopted to try and encourage other countries to adopt um, more stringent climate policies. And so there's this external pressure to clean up uh, production and therefore to clean up global value chains. 
So in terms of the policies that we, we looked at um, as, as methods of decarbonizing global value chains, we focused on three or four, and I'm only going to talk about two in this in this presentation. So we talked about trade policies and how subsidies and tariffs and regulations and so on can be used to decarbonize global value chains. We talked about carbon pricing, in particular um, carbon border adjustment mechanisms as a, as a means of decarbonizing global value chains. We then touched upon the idea that technology transfer, so the production of technologies, but also the diffusion of that across borders will be a crucial aspect in sort of complementing carbon pricing to decarbonize value chains. And finally, we talked about embedded accounting frameworks and, and the sort of approaches that could be used to make sure that these frameworks that are perhaps adopted nationally can be interoperable to allow and trade to flourish while also allowing for the monitoring and regulation of, of CO2 emissions in, in production. So as I say, I'll only focus on two of these give, given time, and I'll start with this, this discussion around trade policy. And what we know um, for, from trade policies is that trade policies can be a useful source of mitigating climate change. So through lowering tariffs and non-tariff barriers on, on clean products, we can, we can encourage trade in, in these green and clean products. At the same time, regulations and standards on, on dirtier products can also maybe limit the extent of trade in, in these, these kind of dirty products. Trade can be a force for knowledge diffusion and technology diffusion of green technologies. And by reducing or removing subsidies on, on carbon products, we can also encourage the flows of, of greener products. And yet we also know that the current, current policies related to trade actually favor carbon intensive trade. So tariffs and non-tariff barriers tend to be lower on carbon intensive goods, particularly those goods that are upstream in value chains, so sort of those involving extraction, for example. So in a sense, the way trade policies are currently structured, they encourage carbon intensive trade rather than rather than discourage it. But things may be changing. And we also highlight in the in the report that, that trade policies are being increasingly used um, by countries in their decarbonization decarbonization plans. So they're they're common in uh, the nationally determined contributions. And what we also observe is that environmental notifications to the WTO have increased relatively rapidly over the last the last decade or so, and they cover various aspects. At the same time, we also know that there are challenges um, in terms of multilateral liberal, liberalization and there are challenges in the WTO and so on. And that means that essentially for much of the last 20 years, liberalization has largely occurred through preferential trade agreements. So we focus on preferential trade agreements in, in the analysis, looking at the extent to which preferential trade agreements and the provisions within preferential trade agreements can be used to decarbonize global value chains. And the figure on the left here simply shows the rapid rise in preferential trade agreements that have occurred, um, again, since the late 90s, early 2000s, at the start of this sort of global, global value chain phase of, of production. And the figure further shows that um, the number of environmental provisions in those agreements has also tended to rise. So not only have the number of preferential trade agreements risen, but also the breadth of these agreements covering all kinds of issues related to labor standards and so on and so on, but especially environmental provisions. And using a structural gravity model, we relate the bilateral emissions embodied in global value chain trade to the presence of a preferential trade agreement and then to the provisions within that trade agreement. The expectations were that the presence of a preferential trade agreement should lead to an increase in emissions traded because we expect that preferential trade agreements lower, lower trade costs. Through that, they encourage global value chain trade and that global value chain trade will embody emissions and therefore would expect through that scale effect for emissions to increase. We also expect, however, or expected, however, that environmental provisions within preferential trade agreements could have a, a negative impact upon on emissions traded in global value chains. This could be due to changes in the structure of trade, so shifting away from dirty goods and towards cleaner goods. It could be due to technological transfer and so on that allows for more emissions efficient production to take place and be traded across borders. And the results which are reported on the right hand side of this figure essentially confirm that. So we find that the presence and the breadth of a preferential trade agreement is associated with higher emissions embodied in, in GBC trade. So there's an increase in the extent of emissions traded between trade partners. And that's due almost entirely to the scale effect, the idea that, that trade increases and therefore emissions embodied in that, in that trade increase. And we further find, however, 
that the presence of environmental provisions does have a negative impact upon emissions trade within global value chains. So environmental provisions seem to be able to serve this purpose of lowering emissions embodied in global value chains. And this is particularly the case for those standards, regulations, provisions in trade agreements that are trade restricting. So they're trying to restrict trade in dirty goods. And what we see is that this is largely driven by the uh, an intensity effect, suggesting that these, these sort of trade restrictive environmental provisions work by shifting the production, the structure of trade that's, that's sort of embodied in, in GVC trade to cleaner sectors and to cleaner products. Then the final the sort of policy that I'm going to I'm going to look at is 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 CBAM, and we we looked at the impact of of CBAM um, using a computable general equilibrium model, and we wanted to examine the the case of of a sh an increase in the price of the the current um, emissions trading scheme in the EU, and then examining to what extent the addition of CBAM will have on that. So we started from a baseline price, carbon price of 18, 18 euro, which was roughly the price in 2017 when the, the data we use uh, is from. And then we looked at a scenario in which the price of carbon increased to 100 euro per, per ton, so from 18 to 100 euro per ton, which essentially is roughly the highest price that it's reached in the last couple of years. And doing that, what we observe is that if we increase the price of carbon within the EU CTS, we see a fairly modest reduction in CO2 emissions of just over 1%. And if we add a CBAM at the same carbon price on top of that, we see a reduction in emissions of just 1.3%. So the effect of the CBAM is, is, is minor. It reduces global CO2 emissions by around 0.2%. At the same time, it does have impacts upon on trade and upon the function of global value chains. And we, and we see reductions in exports to the EU across um, Asian regions and countries. And we also see reductions in exports more generally and, and output. So it does seem to have a, a, a minimal, a, a minor effect on, on emissions, but can also impact upon on the functioning of global value chains and reducing output in, in, in the developing economies within Asia, especially. Okay. And in considering why that effect might be might be quite minor, one thing we focus on is the idea that there, there may be carbon leakage. The idea that if we, as we implement a border adjustment mechanism, some of the production, particularly the downstream production within the EU, may shift to uh, other countries. So automobile production may shift out of the EU, for example, to avoid paying that carbon tax on its intermediate goods. So that would offset some of the, the effects of the higher carbon price within the EU. The other aspects that are relevant, of course, is that at the moment, CBAM only covers a relatively small number of sectors, just six sectors. And it also covers a relatively small number of countries and therefore a relatively small amount of trade. So then we considered what would happen if we extended CBAM to other countries. And we focused on a couple of scenarios. So one would be what happened if we expanded it to OECD members. And then what would happen if we extended it to OECD plus the ADB regional members? And what we see in terms of emissions is that expanding to the OECD and to, and to other ADB regional members increases the effect on carbon emissions. So we see a reduction of around 3.7% in the case of ex an expansion to the OECD. And we see a reduction of 8.7% as we expand to the ADB regional members. And this sort of highlights, I think, the, the idea that CBAM, as it's currently implemented, will, will have limited effects because it's, it's ignoring um, many of the countries that are major producers, major manufacturing producers, especially in, in order to have a, a sort of a, a strong effect on carbon emissions reduction, we'll, we'll need a wide, wide coverage in terms of country coverage for this for this mechanism. And this sort of showcases this quite nicely, that expanding the coverage across countries increases its impact upon emissions reduction. It also has fairly heterogeneous effects on output, though, and, and obviously when we expand CBAM to the OECD, what we, what we observe is that many Asian economies and regions benefit in terms of output. The reason being that production, again, shifts out of the OECD and, and, and to some of these other countries through, through carbon leakage. But when we expand to ADB regional members, again, many, many countries and regions benefit, but some, some suffer. And I think this highlights the importance of, of thinking about mechanisms and incentives to encourage countries to, uh, to join these um, border carbon adjustment type mechanisms and ETS systems, because there is a risk that some countries will lose out from this. 
And so we do need various compensation compensation mechanisms in, in order to encourage, I think, countries to join these join these mechanisms. So just let me finalize with, with a couple of conclusions. So what, what we've tried to show in this report is, is the importance of global value chains to emissions production, and then to think a little bit about how global value chains can continue to serve their development role, while at the same time, um, not not contributing majorly to, to climate change and to, and to CO2 emissions. And we focused in this presentation on a couple of things. Firstly, are the provisions in trade agreements. And we've highlighted that these can be an important means of decarbonizing global value chains. And that's especially important in the context of um, PTAs that account for around 60% of global trade. What we haven't focused on, however, and this is something for future work, is that there is also a risk of trade diversion. We are ignoring that other 40%, and it could be that what's happening with more stringent environmental protections and trade agreements is that trade's being diverted to non-members. And that obviously suggests that in addition to these plurilateral efforts to uh, to decarbonize global value chains, there also need to be multilateral efforts to create a rules-based rules -based system uh, for environmental standards. And then finally, we talked about carbon pricing and, and carbon border adjustment mechanisms, which we believe are, are, are crucial in, in decarbonizing production and decarbonizing production uh, the emissions in global value chains. But we also believe that they're going to need to be um, accompanied or lead to technological change. So to increase their emissions efficiency that we, we talked about in the, in the first couple of slides, but also lifestyle changes to reduce maybe consumption per person in order for these carbon pricing mechanisms to be um, most effective. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Neil. Thank you very much for your very um, excellent presentation, which has covered all the important message and analytical uh, results from the AIR 2024 theme chapter. So now uh, we are very pleased to be joined by two esteemed experts who, who can discuss the, uh, the the theme of the today's seminar, which is on the decarbonized global value chain. So first, uh, um, uh, Ms. Salu uh, Bukibayeba, uh, she is the research fellow at the School of Law at the Australian uh, National University. And then the another uh, panelist, uh, who is the Jan Dubal, uh, who is the Chief of the Trade Policy and Facilitation, Trade Investment and Innovation Division of the United Nations, ASCA. And then I also expect uh, Neil to join the panel discussion at the same time. Uh, so let me uh, start with the Jan first, with my first question before I open the floor to gather some of the questions from the Q&A box. So let me just go first round uh, of the question to each and each panelist panelist first. Uh, so our uh, report has provided quite a deep analysis on the potential impact of CBAM. So while the CBAM itself uh, should have some its own legitimate uh, uh, goal in leveling the playing field between the EU firms and uh, outside firms and also the, the incentivizing other countries to join the, the stronger carbon uh, climate ambitions. But at the same, same time, from exporters' perspective, it's kind of a typical example of unilateral policy, which can also have some potential implication uh, related to the WTO compliance. So I'd like to ask your view so on the how, uh, what do you think about the potential uh, uh, future track of this kind of unilateral policy, including the CBAM, whether this kind of unilateral trade policy involving the climate goals will become the new norm of the international uh, policy, and also uh, whether we will likely to help um, the intended uh, result in encouraging others to join the more ambitious uh, climate goals. Over to you, Yan. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chong Wu. Um... So, I mean, first, let me congratulate uh, ADP and, and Neil for, for the presentation. I think it's, uh, it's a very insightful report. Um, and I want to highlight one thing that Neil said um, on, on the global value chains, right, um, during this presentation, which is that global value chains are not causing uh, the higher emissions, right? And this is, I think, something to, to keep in mind when looking at the figures in the report and, and uh, because uh, the higher emissions uh, are associated with uh, production mostly and co or consumption, right? So I think when Neil was talking about uh, lifestyle changes necessary, I think this is also something to keep in mind. Um, if you don't have global value chains, if the lifestyle doesn't change, the production will still happen somewhere. Uh, and it may happen in the locations that are uh, actually more uh, inefficient uh, and worse for the environment. Right? So I think we all have to keep this 
uh, notion in uh, in mind when discussing uh, decarbonization of, of global uh, value chains. So now going back to your um, to your question on whether um, there is likely to be more unilateral policies, I would say I would say unfortunately uh, yes, uh, uh, definitely global solution uh, is is better. It's very well acknowledged. Uh, but very little progress has been made uh, at the global level. Um, and so this is one of the reasons why um, large economies uh, are taking some uh, unilateral step uh, in, in some cases. I had a chance to be on a panel uh, last year at the WTO Public Forum um, uh, on uh, discussing actually the initiative of the US, of China and the EU on trade and climate change policies. Right? Uh, and then uh, they were compared by different speakers. And, and indeed, uh, it revealed that uh, they were all, uh, all I mean, US, China, EU were all increasingly taking unilateral approaches. Uh, I mean, with the China and the US approach, uh, focusing actually more on subsidies uh, and the EU approach, focusing more on a combination of um, internal and border measures. Right? So, uh, Referring specifically to CBAM, I think it's important to recall that CBAM uh, is really an adjustment uh, mechanism uh, that is directly linked uh, to the carbon pricing measure that the EU producers must comply with. Right? Um, and so the, the, the idea, uh, in a way, uh, and one can argue that uh, it is not discriminating against countries outside the EU bloc uh, and just leveling the play field, playing field in a way. To making sure EU producers remain competitive within their borders, right? So this is a view, I think, uh, on, on the EU side, right? Uh, and, and the problem with CBAM, in a, in a way, then is not so much whether it viol violates WTO law, uh, but really uh, that it violates uh, the common and differentiated responsibility principle uh, of international environmental law, right? Uh, and this common and differentiated responsibility principle is, is a very important one. Uh, it, ZIBAM just does not take into account the fact that developing countries outside the EU uh, did not contribute as much to CO2 emission uh, than the EU, EU did uh, over time, right? Uh, during its development process, right? So, so that's, uh, that's one thing that can be argued. On the CBAM side, I mean, I think two challenges that, that uh, uh, have been highlighted related to, to CBAM is that First, it's not clear how you can accurately calculate uh, CO2 emissions embedded in different goods. And so again, I've seen in Neil's presentation that one of the recommendations is to, to work on this, right? And that's a big issue because uh, unless there is agreement on how you calculate CO2 emission embedded in the, in the goods traded, it's going to be very difficult to, to put uh, proper adjustment and, and not have the, a discriminatory system in place. And the second issue, it's, uh, it's also not very clear how you can accurately uh, ascertain how much uh, producers in the partner countries pay for CO2 emissions. Uh, and the, the, uh, because there is really a wide range of direct and indirect policies and mechanism related to pricing in CO2 emissions and, and, and impact on the environment in general, right? So yes, in many countries, there is no car direct carbon pricing mechanism, uh, but there may be other other levies and taxes and things like that, that maybe should be taken into account and that, that do a similar job, right? So it becomes very difficult um, uh, to, to, to do proper assessments. Uh, on the positive side, I would say that the CBAM implementation challenges I just mentioned uh, uh, may actually uh, make the CBAM initiative very useful uh, by themselves because it will provide a very strong incentive uh, for measurement standards uh, to emerge in terms of carbon emission, and also harmonize carbon pricing mechanisms, uh, which in turn you know, will make it easier for a global carbon pricing mechanism to emerge. And, and based on ESCAP research, and not only ESCAP research, but research uh, by many other uh, organizations, I mean, really a global carbon uh, pricing uh, mechanism is really the best solution and really is the way to go, right? Uh, but you can't get it to it directly. So unilateral measures can be seen as, a, as possibly uh, a step uh, towards ultimately arriving at a system like this. So in conclusion, yes, uh, I think CBAM, uh, especially if other major developed countries follow suit, uh, is likely to be successful in encouraging others to become more ambitious regarding their climate goals. Uh, 
Uh, but again, CBAM should really be adjusted, or CBAMs, right? Not necessarily the one of the EU, but the, the others that may actually emerge, right? Should really be adjusted to follow the, this uh, common and differentiated responsibility principle. And, and what we've done in SCAP, because uh, we've done research on, on the CBAM impact as well, uh, in collaboration with Antel and UNEP back in 2021. So I'm very happy to see the results by ADP are very, very consistent with what we found. And, and a first and low cost step towards, um, you know, uh, taking into account the CDR principle in CBAMs and for the EU, right, would be to exempt LDCs from CBAM. Um, and so what we found is if you exempt LDCs from CBAM, so least developed countries, um, this actually has no uh, measurable impact in terms of uh, increasing carbon leakage or, or so on. So I think this is a simple step that could be taken. Um, and then others you know, can be discussed in more detail. Uh, let me stop here for now, and I'm happy to to come back thank if you have questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you have made very valid points in terms of the potential implementation challenges uh, with respect to the CBAM and also potential um, non-compliance with the so-called uh, the common but uh, differentiated responsibility principle and also the the best policy solution um the, i mean the with the global uh, carbon pricing mechanism and some likelihood that, that, that there will be more and more the unilateral approaches in the context of the uh, national in industrial policy under the new area of the industrial policy regime so those kind of uh, uh, growing challenges will be the the affecting the, the the trade and then the climate uh, policy landscape of the many developed countries in the region. So we can have some more discussion. So let me now move on to uh, sell. Um, the uh, our uh, AIR twenty twenty four discusses the importance of embedded uh, count emissions accounting mechanism as a, a key element in the decarbonizing the global value chains. And also, uh, it highlights the, some of the challenges in developing such frameworks and ensuring that they are in, interoperable on a global scale. So from your expertise of having working on uh, this area in particular, what do you think that uh, what needs to be done to ensure scientific, transparent, and interoperable accounting mechanisms regionally and even globally in the future? Yeah, thank you, jong -woo. And thank you, Neil and Yan, for also kind of laying the foundation of what I'm going to talk about is the emission accounting, you know, because we can't manage something that we cannot count. Um, so the the push for the embedded emission accounting frameworks were initially the CBAM type of policies, but then we realized that actually emission accounting underpins all sorts of policies, domestic policies, in the green industrial policies. There are lots of private initiatives as well. So um, the emission accounting itself has been uh, initially driven by the private industry, by the private sector quite a lot. But what we realize now is that we have such a proliferation of approaches that give us very different results. So the different definition, different approaches, boundary definitions. So we're finding ourselves in a place where we can't compare. It's not an apple to apple comparison. So um, I, it seems like like the the latest scope has shown that even the private industry is realizing that it's time for the governments to sit down and also talk about okay what are the approaches and we need to move forward towards mutually recognized interoperable and trusted emission accounting methodologies and uh, this is actually is what's happening now because we're seeing the emergence of the so-called international green economy collaborations where um, governments or trade par partners literally sit down and uh, facilitate uh, green value chains. But in the process, among other things, they also focus on the regulatory alignment. So literally sitting down and, and defining what is green technology, how do you account for, uh, for the emissions embedded in the product? And it, it's a, it's a, um, a big note here is that we're not talking about national accounts because they have very well established methodologies, but we're talking about emissions embedded in the products. So, so we see this happening and I think it's getting us somewhere. Um, and a number of uh, countries are already working on uh, developing embedded emission accounting frameworks for mostly extractive and manufacturing products. 
Um, but at some point, we'll also talk about agriculture, and this is where the complexity comes, and I think Jan has already kind of brushed upon this as well, is that in agriculture, emission accounting is so complex, and it has something to do with, a lot to do with just the, the, the complexity and uh, the uh, the cyclical nature of the emissions, and there's lots of uncertainty in emission accounting, there's uh, not enough accuracy, and there's lots of uh, natural variation as well. So if we start uh, counting embedded emission accounting, uh, embedded emissions in agricultural products, we will have to rethink a number of important design features like boundary definitions, what goes into the accounting. Um, there are also things like co-product allocation rules that have a lot of impact on your uh, emission accounting results, um, the time horizon for global warming potential. So uh, think, lo lots of things, I'm not going to go into technical, um, I guess, the jargon. But um, also we have to keep in mind that agriculture is so intertwined with other biodiversity, uh, sustainability criteria, uh, livelihoods, uh, water use. So um, really developing a carbon tunnel vision for agriculture could be quite um, dangerous. And there are also a, a number of important considerations for developing countries because um, some of the accounting methodologies that exist for agricultural products are actually not well suited um, to reflect the environment and production systems in developing countries. Um, they also might lack capacity to substantiate their claims, right? So we have to be mindful of not creating implicit trade barriers for developing countries. So it's not that the governments have to build something from scratch. There's lots of methodologies exist and they are all backed with science, right? So ISO standards, uh, more sector uh, guidances, even far farm level emission accounting tools have also like lots of scientific um, ground to, to, to stand on. The problem is they're not very well aligned and also they're not very well suited to reflect um, the processes that are taking place in developing countries. So I'm, I'm also trying to be mindful of the time. So I'll probably stop here. Okay, Salo, thank you very much. Yeah, it's uh, in a sense encouraging to hear that, that there are a lot of efforts being made at the moment on this front, but at the same time, the lack of interoperability, perhaps the mutual recognition, and then the uh, cross-border functionality, that problem still exists, and that, that's where uh, policymakers in the region and beyond will have to have to think about more. And then the, in, in the context of the forging more the international cooperation and the regional cooperation in the future. So with that, I'd like to uh, uh, move on to Neil. Um, so you are you are playing the dual role as presenter as well as a uh, <laughs> so, um, the With the rise of the geopolitics in recent years in particular, um, the, there is a lot of challenges uh, regarding the role of the international cooperation multilateral agreements, uh, which can play an uh, important role in addressing the climate change uh, problems. So in your view, uh, what do you think that uh, governments can, how governments can work together to ensure that the uh, global value change can serve to mitigate climate change uh, risks while at the same time remaining a force for the economic development? So it's very broadish, but uh, I'm sure that you can press this issue. Yeah. Yeah, no, thanks for going. I'll, I'll try and narrow that down a little bit. Um, so I think a, an important thing we need to bear in mind before answering that question is that there has been a lot of talk about the role of geopolitics and impact on global value chains and so on. But actually, if we look back over the last 20 plus years, global value chains have proven to be quite resilient. So if we think about the global financial crisis back in 2008, recovery after that after that crisis was was quite, quite rapid. We see something similar using the ADB's data when we look at the pandemic recently. So again, there was a big drop in global value chain trade during the pandemic, but it recovered quite rapidly. And again, global value chains have also been quite resilient in the context of, of some of the geopolitical tensions that we've seen over the last 10 or so years. So I think we, we need to be a little bit sort of careful to maybe, to maybe um, diminish the resilience of global value chains thinking about this. At, at the same time, it's almost certainly the case that the past is not necessarily a good predictor of the future. 
And and what we may see as we as we move forward, as 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 geopolitical tensions remain, as the importance of climate change and climate change policy becomes more relevant, we may actually see that aspects of climate change are driving these geopolitical tensions. And here I'm thinking things like critical minerals and so on, raw materials that are relevant for, say, green technologies, and that there may be geopolitical tensions rising over those kind of aspects, for example. So I think I think it is relevant to, to, to ask this question. And it could be that these kind of technologies are a leading source of the uh, the tension that, that comes up in, in the future. So then to the question of, of what to do. I mean, in my, in my presentation, I was sort of highlighting the fact that there, there have been some issues in terms of multilateral cooperation, but that's not an excuse not to try it, I don't think. And, and OK, okay there, are, there are issues in the WTO, but there are other, there are other forum, UNFCCC and so on, where there are opportunities to try and develop and implement climate and environmental um, agreements in a, in a multilateral way. And even within the WTO, we, we've seen recent examples. So a couple of years ago, about half a dozen small economies, including New Zealand and Fiji, began efforts to develop a, a, a WTO agreement on climate, trade and sustainability, for example. So there have been efforts in that multilateral sort of field to try and do this. Obviously, from from our work, the other aspect that would be relevant is is the role of trade agreements, and that it, again, given some of the challenges in the multilateral um, area, there may be maybe some possibilities in terms of trade agreements to try and enhance the regulations and standards to to, to as, as a way of cooperating to to deal with this challenge of uh, climate change while maintaining GVCs as a development tool. Um, and then I guess the other dimension, which is which is sort of creates that sort of bilateral link between the two is that on the on the one hand we can think of global value chains as being a, a driver of climate change and the source of some of these tensions for example but the other goal of global value chains of course is it is as a, a form of a trade and investment and so on and, and this trade and investment can also be used in cooperation and in encouraging green trade encouraging green investment can be used as a way of decarbonizing value chains while maintaining and potentially even accentuating their role as a development development tool so the the trade in green technologies trade in renewable energy trade in environmentally friendly goods and so on Countries can work together in the context of global value chains to allow the free flow of these of these um, goods and services to encourage the decarbonisation of value chains. Well, again, while maintaining their, their their relevance as a development tool, and there are various ways of doing this through tariffs, through non-tariff barriers, again through trade agreements, and so on. So I think I think that sort of is perhaps the the primary um, way in which governments can co cooperate in, in thinking about. Um, global value chain serving that dual role of decarbonizing and, and being a development tool. And maybe one, one final comment is that the other dimension of this is that there are likely to be equity concerns, both within and across countries. So climate change will lead to structural changes within economies. Climate change will benefit some common, in terms of global value chains, some countries at the expense of others. And again, that was something that was highlighted in the results of the CBAM exercise, for example, where we saw output in some countries rising in response to an extension of CBAM and, and declining in others. So there'd also be a need to think a little bit about um, compensation mechanisms, both within countries as, as structural change occurs in the context of global value change, but also across countries. And again, I mentioned in my, in my, in my presentation that we do need to think about what are the mechanisms that could compensate those, those losers um, in, in terms of climate change policies. Um, the obvious example would be what what should be the use of the CBAM revenue, for example. At the moment, that's a little bit unclear, but there would be opportunities to to use that CBAM revenue to encourage the kind of technology diffusion that could that could offset some of these negative impacts on on production and trade that we that we observe. So I, I think that is perhaps in terms of global cooperation, another another major aspect in which we need to focus on in terms of how can we ensure that um, the losers are compensated as a way of motivating and incentivizing others to to join these efforts to decarbonize. Okay, thanks. So thank you, Neil. Thank you very much. So I'm also mindful of, uh, of the time constraints. So let me uh, try to pick up a couple of questions from the Q&A box from the audience. So my selection of the question uh, should be based on the number of uh, likes attached to each and every question in the uh, Q&A box. So uh, the first question I'd like to pose to the panelists is the, the one on the trade. Uh, trade role in the, the GBC story. So trade is an in integral part of the GBC story since it supports cross-border improvement of both goods, 
and then services. How can trade support greening production networks and GBCs while supporting economic efficiencies and gains from cross-border division of labor? And how can trade facilitation in particular help decarbonize the GBC? So I think the, this uh, question well fits uh, with uh, Jan's expertise and uh, background. So uh, can Jan uh, provide some answers to this question? Thank you, Joe. Yeah, happy to. Uh, in fact, our uh, our work on, on climate smart uh, was on climate smart trade and investment rather than uh, global value chain. So we uh, so we we try to focus on on, on trade aspect um, quite a lot and isolating it from you know the production side and the production aspect because again um, I think those two things should be distinguished quite a bit. A lot of the emission are associated with actual production and not with actually the trade process itself, right? Um, and so uh, what we found is that um, uh, actually there is a, a very uh, good potential uh, for a positive impact uh, on trade and, uh, and the environment. Right? Uh, and, and then there is a need to rethink trade policies with the environment in mind, right? Uh, but not to stop trade altogether or to, to put barriers to trade. Uh, all together, right? Uh, because trade, uh, as Neil just mentioned, also uh, can have positive impact, uh, and this impact can also be uh, channeled through global existing global value chain. So, reducing tariffs on environmental and climate smart goods and technology is one way to go. Uh, adoption of non-tariff measures, uh, such as minimum energy efficiency standards for equipments, uh, is also another way to go. So, actually, it's actually increasing uh, non-tariff barriers in a way, uh, but that those non-tariff barriers are actually uh, uh, barriers that are there uh, to enforce new standards related to, uh, to efficiency, to energy efficiency, that will ensure production actually is, is done in um, is, uh, is, is less environmentally damaging, right? But if you're talking about greening GVCs, I think trade and transport facilitation are essential. And so one, one thing we've been doing in ESCAP is looking actually the trade procedures themselves. Um, and in our research, we find that digitalization of trade procedures and, and going paperless uh, can have a significant impact on reducing CO2 emissions on a paid transaction basis, right? So for each transaction uh, you do without paper, uh, we find that you can save CO2 emission equivalent to those absorbed by 1.5 tree, right? So if you if you scale it up to the regional level, it's we're talking about planting 400 million trees, uh, global level 1 billion trees, right? So it's quite significant. Um, and then one interesting finding is that uh, all those savings are not associated uh, with just uh, getting rid of the paper or the ink use, right? but it's very much more associated with the efficiencies that come with using the electronic data and documents uh, to make the, the, the value chains and, and the, the supply chain much more efficient. Right? Um, because of time, I will stop here, but I will just mention that, in fact, one uh, I mean, big issue uh, when you think about trade aspect in global value chain is uh, is the impact of, uh, of transport, right? international transport. So I think there is a big uh, need to green uh, international uh, transport as well. And there is some efforts uh, on this uh, happening in, in various countries. Let me stop there. Yeah, thank, thanks, Ian. Thank you very much. So when it comes to the GBS-related uh, carbon emissions, the transportation should be an integral part, along with the production-related emissions at the same time. So uh, let me pick up uh, Oh, one more question from the Q&A box. The question seems to be relevant to the NEOs, perhaps. The question is about while the CBM has limited impact on the rest of the Asia and the Pacific, uh, its impact on um, Central and West subregion appeal to be considerable vis-a-vis -vis other subregions. Could you el elaborate on this finding, including policy su su suggestions or measures for the subregion? So this is specifically about the potential negative impact to the Central and West Asia subregion from the CBAM. So, uh, Neil, uh, would you like to respond? Yes, let, let me let me try. And I think um, it's useful to start with a, with a sort of um, a caveat. When that is, this the, this modeling is undertaken using a, a CG model, which has many moving parts. So it's quite difficult to try and explain some of these some of these different results. But but saying that, I think I think in this case there are probably a few aspects that, that are relevant. No? Um, and in the context of of Central and West Asia, I think there are three things that are relevant. One is Central and West Asia is obviously very proximate to the EU, and therefore the EU is a very important source of, of trade and of demand for, for this region. 
secondly, um, Central and West Asia, at least in some sectors, is, is quite emissions inefficient relative to other other regions. So it's it's, I guess, relatively dirty. Want to say that compared to some other regions. Um, and thirdly, the structure of Central and West Asia's trade is also maybe a bit more focused on those sectors that are that are relevant to CBAM than some of the some of the other um, regions. I think those those three different those three aspects drive this result to some extent. And the way we talk about this in the context of the report is to think about a substitution and income effects of, of, of these of these policy changes. So in the context of CBAM, there will be a substitution effect potentially whereby production and trade that's taking place in Central and West Asia maybe shifts away from Central and West Asia back to the EU because now the EU becomes relatively more um, competitive because the, the other, country, other countries and regions are paying the same carbon prices as firms in that region. But it could also mean that there's a shift to other regions um, as well. So there may be this substitution effect of, of production and, and trade shifting away from Central and West Asia back to the EU, but also to some other regions. And secondly, there's an income effect. So we'll be, we'll be it that the, the, the the leveling of the playing field, so to speak, helps the EU in a certain sense. It also is the case that production demand falls in the European Union. And obviously that will have impacts upon other countries and regions because that will lower the demand for their goods. So there'll be this negative income effect. And obviously in the case of Central and West Asia, that income effect will be relatively large again because of the proximity to the European Union and the fact that the European Union is such a, a relatively large source of demand for these regions. So I, I think some combination uh, of the of these different aspects explain explain the result for Central and West Asia. Now, in terms of what policies could be recommended, I mean, obviously, in order to alleviate the problems of, of CBAM, increasing your emissions efficiency is is a is a primary one. Um, I think, in a general sense, there's also an incentive for the region to maybe also diversify its production, maybe a little bit away from some of the more extractive industries towards uh, towards other industries that are less less emissions uh, um, intensive. That can have an impact upon their carbon footprint and upon on the effects of things like CBAM, but it could also have other positive developmental impacts through diversification. We can maybe shift into um, higher paying jobs, we can maybe shift into sectors that are more technologically advanced or where the opportunities for more technological advancements take place and so on. So I think perhaps those are the, the, the two main 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 aspects. One, one is to sort of improve the efficiency of the existing sectors. And secondly, would be also to think in this context about how the economy can diversify both to deal with the carbon problem, but also to um, shift into sort of higher value added, more complex, more technologically advanced sectors that could also benefit the economy more widely. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for your very um, concise and, and comprehensive response to the question. So, um, I I think uh, we have come to the end of this uh, webinar, and I don't think I am in in a, any position to summarize all the rich discussion we have had so far. But uh, the uh, issue of the how to continue to maximize the economic benefits gains from global value chain at the same time, how to minimize the environmental footprint of GBC and the globalization should be at the core of our uh, continuous discussion in the future at the national level, regional level, and beyond and globally. So with that, I'd like to approach all the contributions and the insights made by the, the panelists, the Jan and the Salu and the uh, uh, presenter, our presenter, Neil. Thank you very much for your contribution and also all the audience for their active participation through the Q&A uh, session. Um, so before I uh, close the session, let me make the short uh, housekeeping announcement, which is about the next uh, round of the Asian Impact Webinar Series, which will be held on the 14th of March, 2024, at the 3 to 4 p.m. Manila time, uh, which will be on the what has uh, COVID-19 taught us about Asia's health emergency preparedness and the response. So thank you very much for joining us today, and I look forward to seeing you again next time. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you.